Shirley Hazard fans in the house. Um, how many of you have been here before? Oh, a bunch of you. Great. So um, welcome back. And for those of you who haven't been here, there's some brochures and pamphlets around telling you a little bit more about us and what we do. Um, obviously, we're well, maybe it's not obvious, but we're also a library and we love old books and new books and new books about old books. And so tonight's event kind of fits perfectly. Um, <clears throat> uh, just a one brief announcement about something that's coming up. This is our last week of programming for the season. However, on December 2nd, we have our annual first novel FET, which is a big party where it's in the whole building and we celebrate the seven finalists for our first novel prize and there's um, lots of food and drink and uh, if you like literary parties uh, go to our website and learn more about it and join us. Uh, just a quick housekeeping announcement we will have an audience Q&A this evening if you have a question and I hope you're thinking of them as the evening goes uh, on, please raise your hand and one of our fabulous interns will bring a microphone to you so that the people who are watching on Zoom can also hear your question. And um, welcome to those of you who are joining us via Zoom. You can type your questions at any time in the chat and we'll read those uh, before we end the event. Um, all right, let me introduce our wonderful guest this evening. Brigitte Alibus is a professor of English at the University of New South Wales, Sydney. She published the first scholarly monograph of Shirley Hazard's writing and recently edited two volumes of Shirley Hazard's work. We need silence to find out what we think, selected essays and collected stories. And she is joined in conversation by Sheridan Hay. Sheridan holds an MFA from the Bennington Writing Seminars, her first novel, The Secret of Lost Things, which features a lost novel by Herman Melville, was a book sense pick, a Barnes & Noble Discover selection, shortlisted for the Borders Original Voices Fiction Prize, and nominated for the International Impact Award. A San Francisco Chronicle bestseller and a New York Times editor's choice, foreign rights have been sold in 14 countries. Along with the Shirley Hazard reading groups here at the Center for Fiction, Sheridan has led our Moby Dick reading group many times, as well as leading the popular Henry James reading groups. And if you haven't taken a reading group with Sheridan, um, check that out. That's something else we do um, that people love and keep coming back for. So without further ado, please welcome them to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thanks so much. Oh, it's good to see familiar faces and members from the, the Great Fire reading group. Um, I'm so excited to be here this evening to talk to Brigitte. I hope some of you have seen the incredible review in the New York Times today um, of Shirley Hazard, a, writer, a writing life. Um, it calls it calls it brilliant, um, uh, meticulous. Like yeah, wow, <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, meticulous. Um, it's just a wonderful review. But every review has been fantastic. The Wall Street Journal had a great review. Um, the Guardian had a beautiful review. So, um, bravo to you, because it's just an incredible book and. Um, and uh, uh, an astonishing accomplishment. I mean, it's, it's 500 pages long, and it's as meticulous as Shirley Hazard's prose, which will give you some idea of um, the level of detail and how, um, I was saying to Brigitte, well, I was kept saying to her, we have to stop talking because we'll talk it all out before, beforehand, but one of the things that, um, is, was, is just astonishing to me is the, the, the level of detail and so I want to ask her about the um, uh, Shirley has its archive um, because um, it, the, you know the letters and the diaries and the, and, and the, the, the biography is just filled with um, the words of Shirley Hazard um, as well but b before we get to that I just really wanted to have kind of a general thing because I don't know um, I, I know I'm not alone in this regard that um, Shirley Hazard is a kind of uh, exemplar, and not just a writing exemplar. The sort of, um, she's so, she has come to, if you know her work, 
um, her essays um, as well as her fiction, you come to feel like she's, she, ha she sets an ethical and principled um, standard of humanity that is <laughs> sort of Im impossible. So the whole question of kind of the idealization of her, I just, um, uh, one of the really things that I loved about the, the biography is that it's not a hagiography. I mean, it is, you do, you know, you really are grappling with Shirley Hazard's self-invention and the insecurities and the difficulties that comes with that kind of um, experience, experiences that she had. But I wondered if that was a question for you, that mm. you, it's almost like, could, it's almost like being blinded by admiration or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Thank you. And, and uh, thank you for being, you know, your generous words. It's really lovely to be here and thank you for coming. Um, so exciting and it'll be difficult to, to stop me talking, I think, <laughs> Good. about the book because I'm so excited <laughs> about it. Um, I have to say, in the beginning, I was driven by, you know, a deep idealism, a deep kind of passion, but it was for Shirley Hazard's writing rather than for Shirley Hazard, the, the public figure, the, the persona of the writer. Um, I came to admire that, that ethical um, performance, that ethical kind of stance that she took when I was editing the essays that, that struck me as. And I think initially I wasn't that interested in her as a, as a public figure. I found it a bit mannered and a bit reserved and um, whereas the, the writing, the fiction was so courageous and so mm. audacious and extraordinary. And that's what you know, drew me in was the, the passion and the perversity and the excitement of the writing. But working on the, the non-fiction, and then slowly as I, as I went deeper into the archive and found the, the diaries and, and the letters and so on, seeing this came to really appeal to me was a sense of herself as a heroic person in the world, mm. as someone with profound responsibilities as a, as a person, as a reader, as a thinker, but also as a writer. Um, and that she's a, well, going back to her early days, she's a young woman, from a provincial world that comes into the big world and she will not let anyone condescend to her, not for a minute, mm -hmm. that she sees her, her path in life as significant, as worth fighting for. Mm. Um, I found that so exciting and that propelled, in a way, much of the narrative. And it's so, um, I mean, it, I was going to say it's unaccountable, but you account for it. I mean, you account for various sources of that bravery and that courage. Um, but um, the, the, the beginning outlines of her life are, are extraordinary. I mean, from the age of 16, never going to school uh, again. And, I, and I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about just the, the profound impact of poetry of her astonishing memory for poetry and how you, because um, early on in the biography you refer to the fact that she was started off thinking that she would write poetry and I wondered if any of that is any, in any of the papers mm. that you came across, any of, her, any of her, what she called her bad poems, but maybe you could just talk about, I mean it's almost as if she was born into language. Certainly born into language, I mean she was a precocious reader, a precocious, um, her mother told the story that at 18 months she recited the house that Jack built in, in its entirety. Um, so, so, so maybe the taste wasn't fully kind of honed at that point. <laughs> um, but then she went, she went into poetry very early and um, that was absolutely formative for her. Uh, I think also there's something really significant about the period, um, that mid-century period, which, I mean, for many people of her generation, it was the opportunity of formal education, tertiary education, mm -hmm. that provided that social transformation that changed their lives and, and opened all sorts of things up. She didn't have that. She had parents who did not respect education. They came from, she's described certainly in Australia as someone who's very elite and, you know, from a very um, yes, elevated ironic, background. Yes, isn't it? That, and yeah. her, both her parents came yeah. from very, very dark and quite unknown. Obscure, kind of, oh, yes, in, obscure, in every sources, sense, yeah. and they did not respect education, and she felt herself to be very much at odds with with their ethos, um, and so. But what she did was seize the opportunity of the 
the great excitement of intellectual life of the mid-century that was particularly forming, uh, particularly around literature. Mm. Um, so she comes to New York, there are institutions like the New Yorker, you know, and, and then she publishes with them. And, and, and I think that context for, for what she produced and what she was reading and so on is hugely important. That you've got publishers, you know, publishing Auden, she's rush, you know, rushing, uh, yes, catching the ferry into the city to right, buy to go, the latest yeah, Auden. Right. But even, in, even as, a, even as a, a young, a very young woman, before she's in Hong Kong, she talks about, you, you, you mention a, a, an episode where she, she spends too, she buys an expensive volume of essays and she doesn't tell her parents that she hides it as if it's contraband, mm. you know, um, and and just the deep pleasure of so I mean so already there what you're what what you're, you have an association with the deepest thing in your yes. life, yes. the most interior thing in your life has the has the added value of being prohibited, <laughs> you know. So well, particularly so, as an adolescent, that's that's really valuable, yeah. isn't it? But um, but also it takes material form. And you know, she talks about the smell of the books and all of that, and how um, it's very sensual. Her her account of reading, and she kept all those books. So amongst her library, um, I found, you know, the the um, Leopardi, Leopardi that, that, that she, she bought, bought in, in New Zealand, in New Zealand to, that, to that teach changed her life. Italian. Yeah. Well, that prompted her to to go off yeah. and learn Italian. The um, the early early Auden's. Um, some of the Russian novels that she bought after she fell in love with um, Alexis. And um, so they, her, her uh, estate has given those to the State Library of New South Wales. So there's an archive of her books, quite properly, I think, going mm. home, yeah. um, up until the early 50s when she comes to New York and starts buying books here and then the others all sort of went mm. to, to different places. But it felt very important to me to keep that that record of the earliest reading of one of the mm. most extraordinarily well-read writers we, mm. we have that, that went home. Well, you, your book of your academic book of essays it has cosmopolitan in the title, and I and um, uh, I, I mean I can't think of anybody I, I can't think of anybody who's come from the 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 sources that she came from who was able to develop. Um, as astonishingly a cosmopolitan sensibility and um, intellectual foundation. Yes. That's just just uh, entirely based on her own, um, I mean, you know, she effort. would seek out people who were, who, who she could learn from and who, who engaged her, yes. but, but she's entirely um, self-taught. Self-taught, yeah. the autodidact, but most definitely. Um, but she also had the great resource of the U United Nations as a kind of repository because there were, the UN in those days attracted really, really interesting, really diverse people and I provided quite a lot of little backstories of many of the people that she wrote about as her friends because they are so extraordinary. Yeah, they you know, are. people quite, quite polymath, quite maverick um, who were working across arts and literature and then they're all choosing to go and work for the UN. So there was this collective investment in that cosmopolitan, in this belief in mm. the, the international as a solution to the problems of world war, the, the, the traumas of world war, it was a misplaced hope perhaps, but it was profoundly important to her. Um, so it's self-taught, but the opportunities were there and she was in New York. She was in a place where she could tap into these, these extraordinary But, but very movements. early on, I mean, her, her, her her perceptiveness and her intellect had to have been apparent to attract the sorts of attentions that she that she did. From starting with um, Alexis, maybe you want to tell that story, which, which seeing as some of you are reading *The Great Fire* with me, um, uh, Aldred Leith's character is has its source in um, in a biographical experience, an autobiographical. It's experience. very very closely yeah. based on. Um, certainly the, the facts of, of, of that romance. She was the 17-year-old working in a, a, an office in, in Hong Kong rather than Japan, and he was a, an older man in his 30s. But speaking about that, that cosmopolitanism, he was a, a white Russian. Mm -hmm. So he had come with his family, escaping from the, the revolution. They travelled across, uh, across Russia to Shanghai. 
He grew up in Shanghai. He spoke several Chinese languages. An extraordinary man. Um, and then was sent to school in England. And he made the point in letters to her that the connection to England for him was poetry rather than the culture, the society, or, or whatever. So he grew up in England, and he sounded like an Englishman and so on, but, but he was someone from a much more cosmopolitan background than Aldred Leith. So to me, that's really interesting that right, she right. kind of fi <laughs> you know, fixes him back in the English world, right. um, when in fact he's much, much more interesting it, than it, Aldred Leith. Yes, it, it's true. Yes. Uh, it, it's almost, but you know, but she's so much more interesting than any of oh, the- Oh, God, yes, than, than Helen, the, yes. The, well, certainly than <laughs> Helen, but even Caro, I mean, she gives, she gives certain of her heroines um, certain elements and in the short stories um, that are, that have a lot to do with broken romances and being involved with married men and older men and and uh, you know working through all of those things but but um, the, the you know that's what I, that's why I, I think that it's sort of fascinating to um, why I began with talking about idealizing her because in fact what you've given us is the level of complexity is actually so much more um, uh, uh, extraordinary. Her life is so much more extraordinary. She was an extraordinary person, most definitely. But I would take issue. I think. I think. I can't think of many literary heroines that are more fascinating than Caravelle. Yeah, that's true. I think yeah. she is. Um, that the, the whole premise of that novel, based on her being wrong, is just yes. Right. So fasc right. endlessly fascinating right. to me, right. um, and I, I think it's one of the reasons we, those of us who love Transit of Venus, love love it so well, much. Well, and also for her, the idea that you know, that the that the knowledge that you need will always be the knowledge that comes too late. Too late. The too tragedy late. is not that lo that love doesn't last. The tragedy is the love. The love that lasts. That lasts. Yeah. Yes, it's um, it's heartbreaking, and it's and it, of course, learned from Thomas Hardy's poetry that that was her, her driver. You mentioned um, a couple of questions ago. We were talking about you asked about her poetry mm. um, and how she described it as bad poetry. It's bad poetry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad poetry, um, and thank God it didn't get published. <laughs> it, you know, um, it's there. It was a, a couple of complete ones that she thought quite good. How can a writer with that extraordinarily just, poetic yeah, style... With, uh, with the con concision and the, con the ability to condense and the perfection of her sentences, it doesn't... Get it so wrong. Yeah. In, you'd in think even, if you, even if, you, if you put line breaks in her sentences, you'd think that there well, would quite. be poems, you know? Absolutely. I, I mean, they take my breath away, her sentences. I yeah. can't, can't get enough of them. And then I read the poem and I don't care, you know, don't, it doesn't move me at all. But also the, um, the, the epigrammatic quality of, yeah. her, of her style. But, you know, um, which, it, which again is, it, it's for, some, for some reason I associate that with, with the fact that she was an autodidact and that her yes. reading was so wide um, and not specialised in, in an odd kind of way. And I wondered also too if you think in the context of, of of how she described her own life that there's she had her own kind of version of idealization and, and mythologizing. Yes. Um, and and so until I read your biography, of course you you know you read Shirley Hazard's wonderful interviews and some of her essays um, that that are autobiographical, and of course you swallow it whole. Because it's um, so beautifully told. Yeah. It seems it seems a sort of it's its own kind of perfection, and of course the reality of her life was um, was quite different. Yes. And I just wondered what you what you think about the the Im, about her impulse yes. to mythologize her own life. I think this comes back to that heroic sense of self that mm. I talked about before. That she was not going to be condescended to by anybody. She was not going to be looked down upon. She knew she was the equal of anyone she met. In her heart, she knew she was as smart as she needed to be. She was full of imagination and she worked so hard at, at acquiring you know, all that reading. All her culture was, was really hard won mm. and, and I think enormously of, of enormous value to her because of that. Uh, so I think that's kind of what's behind it. It is an extraordinary sense of self and of presence and 
alongside that, and this is why I think she focused so hard on being a writer, was that she felt that the writer was one of the most important figures in, in society. And those essays, you know, it, it is about the role of the poet, the poet in, in the city, in the state. The poet's role is to tell the truth, is, is not to shirk from unpleasantness or difficulty and to be courageous because we know that, you know, politicians will not tell the truth in the same way. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, in this day and age, that feels like a really necessary Absolutely. Um, account of And it couldn't be, it, it couldn't be um, a more political act the precise word, the value of the yeah. of the uh, the value of of um, veracity, is, as she puts yes, it. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And and having having the courage to to do it, as she did with the the United Nations. I mean, she was she was criticised endlessly for her stance on the United Nations. Later in her life, she was criticised a lot by her friends because she wouldn't stop talking about it. So right, there's a right. kind of you know error of judgment there. But I mean, she was the person who broke the the news about Waldheim, called Waldheim's Nazi you know, past. Well, yeah. the fact that he'd covered it up. She right. said, "Look, right. things happen. You know, Austria, Germany, the war." But he he mendaciously covered it up, and she wrote about that. And um, in fact, a U.S. congressman, Stephen Solarts, read her piece and followed up, talked to her talked to the, her sources, the people um, who knew about it, and then wrote, and so this is amongst her papers um, mm. at Columbia, wrote to um, Waldheim and said, look, is this true? And Waldheim responded, absolutely not. You know, so lying, so, right, you know, so an official lie. Yeah, an official and then, lie. <laughs> and, then um, and, and she was being attacked in, in, you know, the news as being a troublemaker and a liar and so on. And then, of course, um, a, a great journalist, Jane Cramer, um, found the, um, the full story and published it, I think in the New Yorker, but I, I could be wrong, in 1985 or six. But Shirley had published this in 1980. So, I mean, it's that kind of work. Yeah. Um, and, and also that she was setting aside her, let's call it her, you know, her, she her was setting work. her real work, her yes. fiction yes. aside because she, beca because she felt um, called, uh, it was her that. responsibility yeah. to do it. But you know, if we could go back a little bit to how it is that she arrives at this, you know, at, at the construction, at the self-invention of this extraordinary, ex mm. extraordinarily courageous self. It seems to me, um, and you do a beautiful job of, of describing how she essentially discovers herself in Italy, and her, um, and it is, it becomes her home. The and, and uh, the Villa Solare, uh, essentially where she grew up. Yeah. And what yeah. she says about the Vivanti family that ran this pensione, uh, they were anti-fascists. She said that 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 this 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 couple in particular, Elena, the mother, made a principled life yeah, believable. Yeah, yeah. The fact that she encountered people um, after all these romantic disappointments. Uh, you know, being embroiled with the wrong people, um, and then the disappointment of the UN. Um, I mean, she, her first book is called Defeat of an Ideal, mm. so it's pretty clear that, um, you know, she had, a, she had a romanticized notion about what this organization's mission was in any case. And then she encounters these people who have actually lived through fascism and, and, ha and have a profound love of poetry. It just seems it's magical. Magical, isn't it? yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, the Vivantos, in particular, um, I mean, it was it was luck really that that brought her to that house. I mean, their story is is extraordinary. Um, Elena Vivante, who was clearly the most important person I think ever in her life, um, mm. was half American, half Italian, um, and her brother had been. Um, oh, the story of the brother. The story of the amazing. brother is just yeah. So he he <laughs> had been involved in anti-fascist protests in the early 1930s in in Italy, and he decided to make one last grand gesture of, of protest against what was happening in the Italian government. So he bought an aeroplane, as you do, and learnt to fly an aeroplane, 
again, and then printed off hundreds of leaflets calling on you know people to up, to rise up against uh, the fascists. Wrote a, a manifesto that he gave to his friend and said, "Look, if I if if I don't come back, this needs to be published," and uh, flew across Rome, flew low over the city, scattered the leaflets, flew off into the distance, and was never seen again. And of course, the, <laughs> the other the, the other magical thing about that that story, apart from it being so poignant, was he he was sort of obsessed with the story of Icarus. So it's yes. almost as if, he and had, his yes. plane was called Pegasus, and it was almost as if he was in, in, enacting. I mean, so, so, so he's, he's right there, figure, you're, yes. you're mythologizing your own life, but it, it's put. become yes, a, yes. a myth, right? That's so true. And, and he comes also out of this, that incredible political engagement, mm. you know, that you would put your life on the line for. And also, he, I mean, he translated uh, classical Greek drama, you know, three plays before he was 20 or something that, right, that were published. Right, yeah. um, and so that family brought all of that together. And um, Leone Vivante, the father, was, uh, a, was Jewish. So as well as having the anti-fascist kind of thing from Eleanor's side, they were also targeted as a Jewish family and they had to smuggle the children out of Italy. And, right. and then, and after having set the Villa Solaya up as a, as a kind of salon for um, progressive intellectuals and poets. Um, so there's, there's that history. <laughs> and then, yeah, and she ends up there. She's given an introduction to them by one of her old boyfriends from the UN. And um, that is, even in the moment, she is aware that everything has changed. Mm. And uh, she begins to write. She gives up poetry and writes stories about being in the villa. Thank God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And, and she, they are, her Italian stories. And, and they the are incandescently they're beautiful. They're just absolutely beautiful yes. stories. Yes. Um, uh, which, which, you know, evoke the landscape and, 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 and are completely imbued with the sense of poetry that she found there. And in fact, Harold, the story that was the first story that she sold, right? The New Yorker, is that right? Or that was the first story that was public? No, Harold. It, Harold was the first story that, she, that sold. she sold, but Harold didn't get published for a while. And she had, even right, though she told right, the she story, that she it. wrote one yes, story. Yes, that's, that's what I mean about the self, the myth, mythologizing her yeah. own life. I, I sat down, the first story I ever wrote, I put it in the, an envelope and sent it, sent sent it to, only to William Maxwell at the New Yorker, the only copy, and, and then I got a check in the mail, basically. <laughs> it didn't quite happen that way. No, she, she'd had two rejections before that. Um, sent it in, I don't, I don't think she kept a copy, I'm sure that part of it, but also through the Vivantes she had met Dwight MacDonald. Right, who right. Was the Which is, it's the, the complexity of the story actually makes it far more interesting yeah. because it was through, so she's a guest uh, in this beautiful, um, in this beautiful villa, um, you know, quite run down. It's not, it's not, it's not that it's glamorous, it's, a, it's glamorous in a but cosmopolitan it's, it's sense. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and Dwight MacDonald is another guest there, and uh, he passes on a story to William to Maxwell. William Maxwell. So, so she, it's not that it was fished, wasn't fished out of the slush pile, in other words, but for surely telling the story, you know, it, it, in later years. It was magical. Yeah, it was magical, so it may as well have just, let's just, just <laughs> and, tell it and that William, way. And William Maxwell made the point mm -hmm. that he said there was never anything to, to edit, hardly. And, and that's all borne out. I've looked at all that correspondence. It's a, it's a comma here or whatever. It's, it, she, he said she came perfectly formed. She, formed he said yeah. she must have done an apprenticeship somewhere, but you know, under whose eyes, he said, I imagine it was her own. And that's what, that's what I found. It's so extraordinary. I think you, you mentioned that maybe the, one of the son, Vivante sons, yes. they exchanged writings and he was published, Arturo was it? Arturo it, Vivante was, was published was a Was published lot, in the New Yorker yes, also yes. too. So they're, they're exchanging things. But um, I think it was actually, um, you, you, you indicate this in, in various places, that um, her letter writing was clearly extraordinary from the time that she was writing to um, Alexei, the, you know, this glamorous figure from who she was parted unwillingly by her parents at 17. And, and in a sense, 
you know, and returns to in the Great Fire, and essentially makes that, mends that break after mm. 50, 60 years or something. Yeah. Um, but she must have, she was clearly um, inspired to write to him in, in, um, in a writerly, in a literary sense, as well as a romantic one. Yes. Um, well, yes, that's true. But one of the really striking things I found is I, 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 we still have her diary from 1948 mm. and 1949, and we have those early letters. And the diaries, I don't know, you look at Sylvia Plath's diaries from the same age, and she's a very similar age to, to Shirley Hazard. Um, her diaries are just exquisite, They're so poetic, so profound. Shirley's are just whining 17 year old <laughs> it, was just, it was so I was like really this woman you know that she couldn't write a bad sentence except and the letters to to Alexis are um, better and she's learning to express herself more kind of heroically more confidently mm -hmm. more assertively mm -hmm. um, but no her, her diaries are not are not a polished writer until after Italy and then everything changes and I mean, one of the things I'm a little bit embarrassed about with the book is just how fat it is. It's, it's such right. a big book. And but it's a page turner, I tell well, you, I swear. Thank you for saying I read it in two sittings. It's just. But, but part of reading. the the heft of the book is the diaries and the letters, um, as, as you said, are so beautiful, particularly later in life. They're so polished. And I think of all her readers through those years mm. waiting for another novel. Mm. And here she is writing these really long letters and they're just so beautiful. She, and, and, and in her diaries, she's recording. So this is later in life, living on Capri, living in Naples, even living in Manhattan. And she's just describing the world around her, the, the, the quality of light. She's always describing it. the clouds, the sun, the sea. The sea beautiful the writing about the sea. <laughs> yeah. but, but also, um, even the sort of epigrammatic element comes into it as well, Definitely. and her wi her wisdom yes. seems to be yes. very much sort of at ha even when she's upset or whining, you know, it seems it seems a better class of whining to me, <laughs> you know. It's just that she. So here's here's one thing that's that that. Uh, here's one little piece of, of, a, of a diary entry that you include, and this has to do with, and, and, and I, 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 I mention this because of this whole idea of sort of self-invention and what it took to become Shirley Hazard, yeah. the courage and the, and the, the will that it took yes. to, to create herself from, yes. from, it's not even nothing, it's, you know, it's from, um, you know, a bad start, essentially, you know, given, given her family life. But this is a moment when she's, um, she's, um, she's married Francis Stiegmuller, which we'll get to in a minute, and he's 25 years older than her, and he's, um, he's already written and published 14 books. He's an extraordinary translator of Flaubert and Cocteau, uh, Polonière. I mean, he's a, a, a very well-connected part of sort of older New York society. And Shirley had just been, she'd be just been published by the New Yorker and they, they, she signs an agreement with the New Yorker that um, they will have, um, they, she, the first things that she writes, they'll have the first look. So this actually is the first moment of economic security that she's ever had yep. her entire life. Um, because the UN salary as a secretary was a pittance, right? And she'd been living with her um, mad mother. And, mm. and, and so she had finally once, she's 32 years old, she ha got her own apartment and it was the first time she ever had anything of her own, um, including the, the furniture that, and, the, and the things around the apartment that she got. And of course then she meets Stieg Muller in a year, they are married, and she has to move everything out from that apartment and put and you know decide to um, you know accept all of his things, including you know Picasso's on the walls and Matisse's and things. But th this is just a little diary entry um, that she wrote about just having to, and it, it just really speaks mm. to this idea of self-invention. The sadness of losing things, 
losing them in more than the sense of having to get rid of them, also in having to feel all their imperfections. These things I acquired with such effort, no one knows what effort. Being made to apologize for them instead of being proud, the complete disregard of what it is to make one's way without a penny other than what one earns, without training, without help of any kind, Will there ever be pleasure to me again like looking around this room in the evening? If I had to let these things go for some reason, it would be all right for me, but without the slightest comprehension and with ridicule or disapproval, no possessions will ever matter to me so much. Perhaps even no possessions will matter again. Between no one knows what effort. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, a working girl, you know, um, in an office, typing, um, taking shorthand. But also threaded through that is the sense that, I mean, I mentioned before, she could not bear to be condescended to. Mm. And Francis Stigmullen was a man of exquisite taste. Mm. Um, and he clearly did not like her furniture. He did not think it was... <laughs> it wasn't good enough. Well, it wasn't his style, mm. you know, and um, she, I mean, she adored him. It was a very happy marriage and so on. But there's a, there's a cruelty in that mm. that she is really alert to. And, and uh, that was one of the big surprises, actually, of, of well, finding yes. that. Well, yes, it was a big surprise to me to read um, you, you uh, give us an, an entire sort of um, pocket bi bio of Stieg Muller, who yeah. is a fascinating figure in and of himself, of itself. And um, uh, again, the idealization of their relationship mm -hmm. f it, when in interviews and in um, yes. conversations that uh, you can um, read about and even um, publishing essays together in, a, in that collection of the ancient shore and stuff. You know, you think of this just this perfect, uh, marriage. perfect of course, which of course is, is absurd, but, but you know, idealized nonetheless. And um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the complications of that because I just assumed that I bought Shirley's entire story about, you know, they met at a party as W.H. Auden was leaving the room and Muriel Spark had fixed them up and Muriel Spark had said to her, you know, uh, are you going to meet the man you're going to marry tonight? And a year later, they were married. Well, that is true. A year later, they were married, and the W. H. Auden part and everything. All of that is true. But there, there, his wife, his first wife after a very long marriage, had had died. He was seeing another woman most of the entire time. There was a huge ambivalence there, as well as other complications. So sorry, I'm just setting you up for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Um... I mean, there was, there was obviously an extraordinary connection between the two of them that was about intellect and uh, literary sensibility as, as much as anything. Um, she always liked older men. Mm. Um, all her partners were significantly older than her, and he, he was. Um, but of course, the other, the other kind of background story with, with Francis is um, the, the open secret, so-called, of his sexuality which I didn't find any final conclusive evidence to, to kind of determine one way or the other. So you, you talk to people from, from that, that time who knew them, and so, but everyone knew Francis Stigmuller was gay. You know? and, then, and so I look at the work that he published and you see there's Flaubert, well that's, that, that has a gay coding for sure. There's, Coded figures, yeah, the, yeah, the drag queen that, the, who wrote Babette. Uh, Babette, yeah. absolutely. Babette's just like a brilliant character, mm. Pocto. Um, and, and so he's very much immersed in, in that aesthetic world. He's a man of taste and erudition and, and deep courtesy. And it was said he was, he was gay. Um, and I found people who said absolutely that was the case and some people from, from that world too mm. um, who said absolutely not true. Um, so in the end, I, I can't make a determination about that. And I don't feel that it matters at all no, no one really minds who people sleep with. Um, I mean, I have my own kind of personal view, but that's not, you know. And I think um, 
what was appealing to her about it was not just the erudition and the, and the taste and the refinement, but also the complication. Mm. So the complication of his attractions, of his affiliations. The person he was seeing was another woman. Um, but Muriel Spark writes to her, you know, yes. have you thought of asking him whether, you know, the other ones are, are he or a she? You know, not not that I'm suggesting anything, but, you know, um, I'm always attracted says, to men. I thought like, of that already. I thought of that. And then, no, no, it's not that. But, you know. Mm. Um, and I think it was, well, he, he was grieving for his wife, his first wife, absolutely. Um, which, which in and of itself is a fascinating story because she had she polio. Is, yes. And so she was confined to a wheelchair and... They lived in Paris in the 30s. She was very wealthy. Very wealthy. She and studied painting with Jacques Villon, Villon who was yeah. the, the brother of um, Duchamp. Duchamp. Mm. And so they hung out with the, with the Cubists in Paris in the, in the, in the 20s and 30s. You just, they just knew everyone. Yeah. They, they and were, just collected things for nothing. And that's, that's how he came by his, having this extraordinary art collection. Art collection. Um, so there's all of that. Mm. She was wealthy and he, he inherited wealth, so that, that's not going to hurt if you're you know, worried about money and, and, and looking to marry someone. But also, she, she says something like, when I looked at his face, he, he, it was not someone who had suffered. It was a face of an interesting person who had lived an interesting life. So she's interested in that. As so the, as the recognition of, of grief, even, is as, as an appealing thing, yes. as an indication of depth as well. Yeah. So to take up your earlier point, the reality is much more interesting than Absolutely. the seamlessly happy marriage. Absolutely. And they do, you know, she, she records in minute detail many of their um, disagreements. Those Over. are fascinating. Not the least of which because they sound, they, they start to echo some of her short story dialogues because yes. they're so sort of snappy. Yeah, yeah. You know. But you can see, you, but she's also very hurt and, and, and the she changes. Was, as um, one of her friends said, and I think I quoted in the book, she did tend to take things personally. personally. <laughs> you know? and, but that's that extraordinary sensitivity and sensibility that manifests in she can walk around Naples and describe what she sees. She can sit in a Tuscan villa and describe the light and the children walking across the fields and the sounds. And it is so precise and so exquisite. That all comes from the same place as that... that capacity to be hurt and, yes, to, yes. and to throw herself into melancholy. There is a, a profoundly melancholic thread running through her work and through her life. Love is always lost. It's always too late. Right. Well, we were, you and I were talking earlier and, I, and, and with the Great Fire Group, this is something, this was a quote that we came across with Aldred Leith says, um, the experiment of love is itself aberrant more often than not and doesn't lend itself to classification. But, you know, that whole sort of was, is Francis Stigmuller a gay thing. You have such a light touch with that, Birgitta, and I, I really thought that it was really wonderful. You said at the end of that chapter, from all this, not much can really be deduced with any certainty and certainly nothing that would challenge or disrupt recognition of Francis and Shirley's devotion to each other. What remains and remains important for Shirley Hazard's life and work is that she found happiness in marriage to a man with inclinations towards literary and artistic figures and subjects marked by complexity rather than transparency mm -hmm. and a preference for the undisclosed rather than the vaunted truth, interest that drew her to him, which she shared. Yeah, this inter I agree interiority with what I wrote. <laughs> of her. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. Um, but, 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 you know, I just... You know, you just close the speculation on it because, and then get on with their actual, you know, with their actual relationship. Yes, and and you know, and that's why it's interesting. You know, is, is because she she wants that complication and she produces it in in all the stories. They are, on the one hand, con conventional love stories. And on the other hand, something completely other than that. Well, you used the word earlier, perverse, mm -hmm. um, and, sh and she gives Leith the word aberrant. I mean, it seems that there is a kind of fascination with that. It, it, you know, one of the astonishing things, I think, for readers of The Transit of Venus is the, is the relationship with, with uh, Caro and Paul and where that goes. Um, and 
and, and the fact that the dead body on the first page, it re relates to that encounter. Yeah. Um, so maybe, I mean, what do you think about that? Because um, even, the, even the perversity, let's call it, of the love relationship in the Great Fire, or the, or the evening of the holiday, it can't, you know, they, they have some kind of moment where they're looking at the uh, disappearing face of a fresco of the Virgin, and it's a, it's, it's a profound moment that you know that the love is sort of seeping away out of this, out of this passion. So, you know, what, 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 what do you think about, about is, it, is it an expression, of, another expression of her complexity? Well, I suppose this is where we move from who she mm. was to what she wrote mm. and what she imagined. And the, and the line that connects them is the act of imagining and the act of creating and of, of fiction. And uh, she begins with, I mean, I really wanted to find Paul Ivory. You know, I wanted to, you know, oh, I wanted, yeah, yeah. I wanted Francis to be gay so that, <laughs> you know, that was the betrayal that led to that great storyline. Yeah, yeah. like, it's fiction. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, extraordinary yeah, writing. It's made up. It's based in apprehensions and moments and hurts and dreams, and it's based in old stories and poems and all those things as well. But that's the genius of, of that book mm. um, and, and of all of them, is that she, she creates you know, completely new trouble, a completely new complication. Um, and that complication of gender f is ancient. It feels like Ovid. Right, it is coming from some, somewhere else. That whole novel is a palimpsest, but I mean, so is The Great Fire. It just seems extraordinary that, that I, and I think you end up turning to her um, autobiography, uh, having a sense of the origins of it, of, of her biography influencing, because you can't believe that, um, that, that the story that she has created, which is so Conradian, and in fact, mirrors even a Graham Greene novel, mm -hmm. yes, The does. Heart of the Matter, that, mm -hmm. that also mirrors an aspect of her own life. You know, so it's almost as if, well, w wait a minute, which came first, the literature or the, was she just, it, you know, was she, did she perceive her life through um, this, the, and the, all the, those her own happen, reading? All yeah. those things happen all at once. All at once. Yeah. All at once. I mean, that's uh, the, the reading I do of the, of the Bay of Noon is, you know, it, it, it's like Twelfth Night. Mm. Uh, not Twelfth Night, sorry. It's like a... Uh, is it Twelfth Night? Sorry, Twelfth Night, yeah, 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 yeah. With the, with the, with the yeah, and, interchanging. And, the, and she yeah. says early on, you know, I came to Italy because I was in love with my brother. Right, with your brother. You know, yeah. I mean... Well, that's the incestuous things that are too, uh, uh, and the, and the draws of, of uh, the draws of that, of, of a... Of a um, of a prohibited intimacy um, are, are profound always. Yes. Um, but also the familiar and ancient stories. Yes. You know, there's, yes. there, there, there are cross-dressed figures that make love happen, that make love possible. Um, and she weaves that into a very conventional love story that, you know, um, so it's, it's, it's that interweaving that I think is, is very distinctive. Mm. <laughs> Well, I mean, I could just keep going, you know, I just keep going on about all of this, but um, I'm supposed to take some questions from the audience, <laughs> sorry. I would love to hear some questions. <laughs> I know, I would love to hear some questions too. Um, and also, I think Melanie can, um, if uh, the people who are on Zoom want to ask a question, I think that there's a facility for them to do that. Also, and I know mo more of the... Um, the Great Fire Reading Group are on Zoom than are here. So if you have a question for Brigitte. So, oh, yeah, okay. So somebody's going to come with a microphone, Jack, because they need to um, hear online. Oh, well, okay, she's going to ask Patricia first. Okay, okay. great. Thank you very much. Um, what, a, what a wonderful talk, and it's great to, to hear you. Um, I was lucky enough to read... Um, the Transit of Venus with Sheridan, and I'm now lucky enough to be part of a Graham Greene group here. And I just finished reading Greene on Capri. Yep. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit. It was, it was very interesting to read about her interpretation of him and yes. their relationship. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, thank you. That's, um, it's a beautiful book, mm. Greene on Capri. It's absolutely beautiful. 
I, well, she and Graham Greene didn't really get on. <laughs> yeah, and she doesn't make any kind of mystery yeah, of that. Yeah. She's quite clear. Um, she thought he was condescending and sexist, and he thought she talked too much. A lot of people thought she talked too much. Um, even Francis thought she talked too much <laughs> a lot of the time. Um, and so, I to me, one of the, the geniuses of that book is that she writes about that kind of irascible relationship. But there's also this extraordinary shared culture, you know, so there's lines like, we were talking of Dryden one day, you know, like, <laughs> as you do, you know, right. and um, so, and she, she writes of that so beautifully that we were part of this, this shared world of reading. Of course, the others are all much older than her, mm. um, so, but, and that's sort of one of the features of her life. But she wrote, so Graham Greene dies in the early 90s, and She's contacted by his friend Michael Ritchie, who's in, who's in the book, and was with him in that scene at the very beginning, um, was in the cafe. When, she when finishes the Browning poem. The Browning poem, poem yeah. um, and, and he wrote to her and said, you know, can you tell me what the poem was? It was such a lovely story. And he wanted to, to sort of talk about that at, at, at the memorial service for Green. And she, in her letter back to him, she basically begins writing that, that book. So, Francis is still alive, but he's um, you know has dementia, and she's spending a lot of time caring for him, and she's prevented from writing because of it. So I think she writes this book as a as a memoir of him mm. and of their life together, and then it really flows ahead after he dies in 1994, and she pours everything out about this this beautiful life, and she writes about the two of them almost like a brother and sister. Mm. She talks about us in the, the storms on Capri mm. and there we are in our little beds, you know, so that, you know, it's, it's, um, it's back to my brother and me, you know, to I was in love with my brother or whatever. So there's this chaste intellectual kind of thing. And Graham Greene is just an occasion for it, I think. Mm, yeah. But he was one of the first writers that she really fell for in a big way. Mm. The book that Sheridan was just talking the about. The Heart of the Matter. Well, The Heart of the, the Matter, in the completely. Yeah. Um, but no, the, the book of essays that oh, she I'm hid sorry. from her mother oh. was a book um, Graham Greene writing about the English oh, dramatists. That's right, yeah. um, so, you know, that's the kind of thing you'd hide from your mother, like <laughs> <laughs> for literary criticism. Uh, but that's the kind of family she came from. So she, and, and she wrote in her diary, you know, SH and GG, who. Who would have ever imagined it? Mm. This is like so. It was so exciting for her to meet and become close to one of her. Do you think Oliver heroes. Leith is a, a, a Oliver Leith is a kind of Graham Greene figure in the in the in the Great that Fire? Makes sense. It almost yeah. it, it, his dialogue almost sounds like yeah. he's a, that comes from Green. That's a yeah. but, um, So so it, it, it had that kind of function for. Her. But of course, it, it raised a real furor. Um, which I do go into in the book, uh, mm -hmm. but with um, Yvonne Cloetta, mm. his partner, um, who wrote these furious letters to Shirley Hazard saying, you know, didn't it ever occur to you, Shirley, to wonder why Graham Greene didn't like you as much as you wanted him to? <laughs> it's like, it really good. So, right. yeah. yeah, no, that was really fascinating, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Jack, you had a question. It seems from everything that you've said and from what I've come across before that, you know, she, that she's an autodidact, but what happened before she was 16 years old? I mean, she must have had some sort of a model or a mentor or something that inspired her to work so hard. Is there, yeah. is there some, something to fill that void? It's such a mystery, isn't it? What I found was she went to a, you know, a good private school. Her parents had, you know, that, that kind of money, and she said, we had a fantastic education, um, and everyone read. And But she's speaking more about the period, mm. I think, you know, that in primary school you were introduced to Dickens, you know, every, every, you she said even the- poems, which she already right. was doing. And she that. said um, even the, you know, the dimmest girls in the class were reading Oliver Twist or whatever and, and coping with it, and then we went on to Conrad and, mm -hmm. and so on. So there's that, broader investment in, in culture that she puts 
her roots in. But as you, I mean, she finds poetry herself. Mm -hmm. And her school friends, so in those early books that she has, her school friends have bought her collections of poems and things. Like she's obviously quite well known as a, um, you know, a nerdy poetry reading type, even in, in the early years of high school. Um, so I think it's just when she reads it, it matters to her, it rings true to her in a way that's profound and personal. And that's the bit where Shirley has it's not like the rest of us. You yes, know? Her, yeah. and her level of perception. But also in the transit of Venus, she links it really beautifully um, with uh, a longing for to be far away. And, 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 and so you haven't really, we haven't really talked about Australia and her and her reception in Australia as a successful writer later on, but, but even the, the, the wish and the desire to be somewhere that wasn't, in her view, a Philistine country, and that seems to be you know, quite young before she was even in Hong Kong. She oh, had yes. a sense of the provincialism of Australia. This, we're talking in the 40, you know, before the, between the 30s wars. 30s and 40s. Yeah. Look, I mean, there's a couple of responses to that. Mm. Um, one is, she just Australia was a lot more, a lot less provincial than, than she believed it to be. There was a literary scene. There were, you know, bohemian art world. Sure, and so on. sure. Just and not she, in her but home. she's yeah. no. <laughs> it's it's very much a comment on her class, mm. which is a, a white middle class mm -hmm. North North Shore, if you know Sydney. Mm -hmm. um, and, and strivers, the, her parents the, are strivers. The diversity that was already a little bit apparent in Sydney was, was not available to her. So that's the first thing I would say. And along with that, she, along with pretty much everyone else in the country at the time, had no, poss no not the least grasp of the deeply cosmopolitan and complex ancient culture and society, mm. 60,000 continuous years of, of culture that no one, you know, is only now starting to be kind of mm. grudgingly recognised. So she, and later she becomes very aware of some of the political kind of resonances of that. Um, so that's a great kind of impoverishment. But I think the simplest answer to that question is her mother, and she describes this in Willara Road, of her mother mm. just longing for, well, Scotland. She hates being in Sydney, she hates it. So I think she learnt that at her mother's mm -hmm. knee too. She, you know, like like the daughter of, of immigrants, you know. Oh, that's a very except, interesting. Even though her father wasn't an immigrant, yeah. she, she pretended he was. Yeah. Um, but she, yeah, she um, just follows her mother's lead on that. And that the, that that the real life belong is happening elsewhere. And then of course some of her education would have reinforced that in the sense that it would be English poets that she had to memorize. Absolutely. And I mean, you probably remember this yourself, I do, you know, having to, having to learn poems about, you know, snow and, and the wind Daffodils, and autumn yeah. and all these kinds of seasonal things that were completely um, abstract concepts, you know, at the time. But, but, but the, the, the vehicle of the poetry is so compelling exactly. and, and that's just, what she's yeah. responding to. And you say a really wonderful thing in here about the idea, you know, because she leaves Australia at 16 and, and while she returns as a, as, a, as a successful writer for various kinds of visits and to give lectures here and there, not very often, she, she, she falls in love with Italy but she lives in New York and there's Capri also. and. Um, she doesn't become an American citizen until after Nixon has um, resigned. That's a whole political thing. But, but you say this wonderful thing about how the absence of a nationality, essentially, is an imaginative boon for her. Yes, yes. That that becomes a source. Yes. Well, I, I took that straight from her. She said, you know, my, my temperament is not a very national one. It is a privilege to be at home in more than one place. Mm -hmm. And uh, she wrote over and over and so beautifully of the joy of discovering Italy and of finding a home there. So it was the Vivantes in Tuscany initially, but then Naples, you know, and it's not the cliched Italy. It's, yes, it's yes, yes. you know, the, the chaos of Naples. And uh, so many of her friends spoke to me be so beautifully about um, seeing how at home she was in Italy, in Naples, you know, all the, the shopkeepers all knew her, everyone respected and loved her. She, she belonged there mm. in a way. 
The other side of it, of course, is the great sadness of, of not belonging anywhere. And mm. um, that was really evident to me when I went and looked at her, her grave mm -hmm. um, and seeing she's buried with Francis's family. So he goes home to his family and she's in a strange place, you know, in a Catholic cemetery. She's not a Catholic. He, he was, or his family were. And she's broken all her ties to her. She hadn't spoken to her sister, well, her sister died. Right. But she hadn't spoken to her sister for decades. Her mother died her without mother, her seeing her. She didn't go home. Yeah. Um, her father wrote to her. She was so furious with her father because he ran off with his mistress and that, that, that was His diabolical. mistress who accompanied the family all over the world. Yep. yep. Unbeknownst an to edifying, the family. An edifying story. <laughs> Um, and uh, Driscoll, so you, she gives that to Driscoll in the great poem. Yes, <laughs> she does. <laughs> um, and she, so she doesn't speak to him for a decade or so, or maybe not quite that long. And uh, and then he writes to her and says, "Look, can we bury the hatchet and you know reconnect?" And so they they exchange a few letters, and she sends him a photograph, and he says, "You know, thank you for the photograph. It's very strange to me to see my daughter and realise I could have passed her in the street and not recognised her." Which is just, you know, that, that really encapsulated for me how even before that final sense of isolation, she was not part of her family. You know, her father would not recognize her. You start to make it, you start to make me realise why the mythologizing of her life is so crucial, why it becomes so important to tell the story of your life the way that you want it to be told. Well, we're all the, you know, the princess rather than the goose girl, aren't right, we? You know, right, it's, um, right. it's that old story. But it's also, uh, and, and because it's so entirely self, it, it, she's such a figure of such self-invention that it's, it's, the, it's a necessity yeah. because of what isn't there. Yes, um, which is, you know, affection, family ties, um, compatibility, conviviality, those things. Yeah. Uh, any kind of recognition of her sensibility. And, and, and substance. Mm. That she could not bear to think of herself as not being a person of substance mm. in the world who, who would make a mark. Can you talk a little bit, um, just while we're at the end, if you, somebody else has another question we can do that too, but just about the criticism that she received from Australia and how, how wounding that must have been. Um, there's, a, there's a, a quote that she says in, the, um, in the, one of the lectures that she gave. She gave this in 1984, we should bear in mind, which is, which is an extraordinarily um, uh, confrontational thing to say in Australia in 1984 because lots of, especially men, wouldn't have acknowledged it. Australia is not an innocent country. This nature's short recorded history is shadowed into the present day by the fate of its native peoples, by forms of unyielding prejudice, by a strain of derision and unexamined violence, and by a persistent current of misogyny. Fighting words. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, she, that, she was not making friends no. when, when she was saying well, that, but still. Yeah, I mean, that, this was a really prestigious series of lectures, the, the Boyer lectures, eminent, prominent Australians are invited and, and they're meant to provoke debate. Um, so the back, there was a couple of back stories there. One is in the early 1970s, Australia elected for the first time a very, very progressive government, government of um, the Labor Party, Gough Whitlam, and in about three weeks, he transformed, he pulled Australia out of the 1950s. He pulled the Australian troops out of Vietnam. He recognised that we set up the thing for, for recognising, the legality for recognising native title, the Australia Council for the Arts, um, you know, the Office for Women, uh, free university, you know, for everybody. It was just, a, it was a revolution. An absolute transformation. And so she goes to Australia in the 1970s and she says it's as if the country has become young for the first time instead of this dodgy 1950s world. It was exciting and there was money, they were going into the arts and there were independent publishers and as Tom Keneally said, everyone was writing a novel, you know, every, it was just this <laughs> incredible... And, she and making was, a film. <laughs> and making, oh, and the, it had a beautiful you know, film industry, mm -hmm. that all crashed in, mm -hmm. what, 1980 with Gallipoli? But, you know. Um, and Francis was completely enchanted with it. He said it was like um, the New Deal kind of mm -hmm. period in, in America. He said Adelaide, they went to the Adelaide Writers' Festival. It's like one of the Greek city-states, you know, this deeply civilised. And she wrote a long piece in The New Yorker called A Letter from Australia. 
and she details this in extraordinary detail. And it's this love letter to Australia, in fact. Um, it, and so I think it was on the strength of that piece of writing that she was invited to do the Boyer Lectures. Oh, I see. Between the late 70s, when she wrote the, the New Yorker piece, and 1984, she'd had a big falling out with Patrick White, um, who had been less than kind about her writing to her. And um, another Australian writer called Murray Bale, mm. um, very closely bound up with Patrick White, was relaying to her all the bitchy things that Patrick and his friends were saying at their dinner parties, mocking Shirley, mocking other women, and mocking Shirley's friends for liking opera. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it, it, really, really unedifying. And she writes these incandes letters of incandescent rage, you know, does no Australian man ever get tired of his misogyny? You know, it's this, this <laughs> <laughs> And she had been planning to leave the art collection. She and Frances had planned to leave their art oh, collection right. to the yeah. Art Gallery of New South Wales, which would have been this beautiful gesture of giving art to the city that had no art, in, in her view. But she was so infuriated with, um, with Patrick White and Murray Bale that they uh, rescinded the uh, bequest. Um, and that's the background to that, that, mm, that, quote, that yeah. quote, which was true. I yeah. mean, one of the things that was so important in the 1970s was this nationalistic kind of fervour, because for the first time there was a culture right. industry. Um, but she was crossed on it, and, 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 and that really wounded her, the cruelty of, of those, those men. And that went on. I mean, a lot of the reviews... She's very much loved in Australia as well, but a lot of the reviews, all of them by men, were... The Transit of Venus was not necessarily... Was dismissed as dismissed this year's... Women's, women's magazine women's fiction or something. Yeah. Yeah, and it's only, it's only really now. Well, I think you, you, you given, uh, I think you have a sense of both the singularity of Shirley Hazard's accomplishment, but, but really the homage that, um, that Brigitte has given that singularity. So thank you. Thank you so much for coming, and, th and, and uh, thank you for white writing thank it. Thank you and, and so marvelous, much for your beautiful marvelous, questions. Marvelous thing. And, and you, you for your questions. <laughs> Okay, thanks a lot. All right, um, thank you both. It was wonderful. And uh, thank you all for coming. If you want to go to the bookstore and grab a copy of the book and then just come back in here, we'll do uh, start the signing line here. If you didn't get to ask a question, you can ask it yes. in the signing yes. line. Yes. Um, and um, yeah, thanks for coming. Fifty more things. She did. Of course, talking, she talking, so talking, well and talking. And everything. No, and no, no. It's just really, just wonderful. How well served Shirley Hatchett clearly did. Oh, thank oh, you. Thank you. Biography. Absolutely. <laughs> it's absolutely oh, true. Thank you. That's, yeah. that's no, no, no. I, I'm, I haven't read the no. reviews of the New York Times Journal, but I hope that they are as every bit as good as they should be. <laughs> thank you. Wonderful book. Thank you. I hope you. Yeah. I hope you